Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the last three days of the Feast of Tabernacles. Yep, I hope you guys have had a uh, good tabernacling experience this week. Um, we have been getting a lot of feedback as far as some spiritual events taking place in a lot of people's lives. I do recognize not everybody will take the time to leave a comment, so I'm sure there's a lot more going on than what we've actually seen by way of comments. So for you guys who are just coming into this experience, I want to congratulate you guys. Um, but is not quite over yet. We still have some important stuff to talk about, particularly the events of the 23rd day and the 21st or the 24th day, I should say. Um, so we're going to talk about about three different passages here discussing these uh, end of tabernacling events. I do understand that it would have been a trying experience for a lot of people, especially dealing with these hurricanes and stuff going on. Some of you guys, including myself, was out there in a tent in all of the rain and stuff like that. But, you know, you guys remember that we are in the 10 days of awe. We've covered this a lot of times on our channel. We're given 10 days to get this stuff right. Starting back there in 2017, uh, we're actually uh, given uh, 10 years to learn how to do this right. And, and, you know, so think about all of the experiences that you had during your tabernacling experience and then understand that there's coming a day when we will all have to sleep in a tent. You know, this is kind of a dress rehearsal thing now so we can work the bugs out, I believe. You know, if your tent is leaking, if you need a new one, if you don't have one or, you know, stuff like that. We're, we're given 10 years to actually work that stuff out so that when we are, um, you know, towards the end of the apocalypse and, you know, we find ourselves having to live in a tent, we already have the confidence knowing that we can uh, survive out there. All right. So the first verse that I want to talk about is over here in Second Chronicles and chapter seven. On second thought, let's jump over to the gospel according to John and chapter seven, because we want to start off talking about the eighth day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'm not sure if I brought this out in my previous class I did on the eighth day. So let's just read here in chapter seven, verse 37. It says in the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and crying, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. So this is the Messiah celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles, as we read over there in the book of John. Um, I think it's important to understand that he did keep those feasts because he was our example um, of how to keep the law. But notice here is that it's on the, the great day, the last day, the day they call uh, Shemini Azdoret. Um, and you see what he's saying there in verse 38. He says, he that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water, rivers of living water. Now, I'm sure we could do a whole class on what these rivers of living water is, but I'm sure it has some type of spiritual meaning um, that we really need to understand. And but the point that I'm bringing it out is, is that it is somehow related to this Feast of Tabernacles. I mean, we do understand that, that we are building the third temple. So, you know, we look over in books like Ezekiel and how that third temple will have a river of water flowing out of it. Um, well, this, I believe, is what it's talking about here when, you know, he's kind of you know, making a connection between the eighth day and of the Feast of Tabernacles and that river of living water that will be flowing out of the tabernacle. All right, so now let's jump over to Second Chronicles and verse 7. You see there in verse 9 is also talking about the eighth day of the Feast of uh, um, Tabernacles. Notice how it says there, For they kept the dedication of the altar seven days, 
and the feast for seven days and this is you know has a lot to do with what's going on here is you know this third temple you know it has the same structure as the um the uh earthly temple that's why i showed you guys uh that picture over there by uh clarence larkin if i could get back to it that was showing you the temple structure because you know each one of those elements that you find in that earthly temple that was or that tabernacle that was built out there in the desert or in the wilderness each one of those elements you'll actually find in our temple in our spiritual temple you have a courtyard you have the altar in the courtyard and then you have the um the area that's more holy which would be get, getting a little bit closer to our conscious and then inside of there you know inside of that that tent in there you would have the holier of holies where the ark of the covenant would be all of that stuff um is in our spiritual temple i did a class one time in in a church environment um where i explained is how um this entire tabernacle um, compound is actually built inside of our spiritual temple but now let's look over at uh, chapter 7 verse 10 it says and on the three and twentieth day of the seventh month he sent the people away into their tents glad and merry of heart for the goodness that the Lord has showed unto David and to Solomon and to Israel his people okay so the uh, Shemini Astoret or the eighth day of the great festival the tabernacles will fall on the 22nd day of the month but now we're looking at the 23rd day of the seventh month and you see here that Solomon is actually sending the people away. So they're they're going away, going back to, you know, where they live. Of course, they would have made that trek all the way to Jerusalem. And it was on the 23rd day that, you know, everybody left. He gave them uh, some gifts kind of thing. Um, there would have been a big celebration as, you know, the people go back to their lives. And that's where we're, we are kind of at now, where we have been building this temple, this tabernacle for over a week now. And then we're kind of going to get back into doing, you know, normal kind of stuff. Some of us, you know, will go back into our houses, you know, and back into that comfortable environment um, and, you know, bivouac is over kind of thing so it's a bigger deal for 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 a lot of us more so than the ones who didn't actually get to sleep in a tent but we're, we've all been involved in this uh tabernacle building period whether we know it or not but now while we're over here let's look at some of the other things that actually went on um after solomon had uh dedicated this uh, this temple you see right here in verse 12 of chapter 7 that the Lord has made a second appearance to Solomon um, you remember the first time he came down and he talked to Solomon um, it was you know it was the time when Solomon told the Lord that he wanted wisdom instead of riches and fame and you know the father blessed him in that manner well you see here this is actually the second time that the Lord appeared unto Solomon and it is right after the uh, dedication of this tabernacle now we have to remember that all of this stuff is a living parable for us so you know after we have um, um, dedicated our spiritual temple we can start to expect to uh, visitations from our father now is he going to come down in a material manifestation that we can actually see you know is there going to be a bunch of thundering and lightning and you know trumpets and stuff blowing as he appears to us like he did back there with Solomon um, you don't think so we don't think so because you you remember the era that we in now you know we're in the um, era which involves um, 
uh, baptism and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. So our Father doesn't have to speak to us in audible tones anymore. He can speak to us through our intuition. He can speak to us through our conscience. He can speak to us through our dreams. Those are his communication pathways. So my point is, is that, you know, as we go on, um, day for day, you know, and we, we kind of got our ears open for our father to come and speak to us. Um, we should be looking for him to talk to us in that manner. Like I said, intuition, dreams, and our conscious. And that conscious, guys, is um, that small, still voice um, that you will hear um, if you can ever get to a quiet place is actually trying to persuade us into righteousness. That's actually the voice of God speaking, you know, directly to us as how he talks to us. And uh, just so you know, dreams is the spiritual communication. He's talking uh, to our spirits. That's a lot of times why we don't understand our dreams is because he's really talking to our spirit, man. He's not so much talking to us like he would uh, with the conscious. And then you have intuition, which we did a, a whole class on intuition um, earlier uh, this week. So you guys should jump over and check that class out as well. All right. Notice what's going there on there in verse 12. Let me go ahead and read it. He says, and the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. OK, so a couple of big points here is one, he's appearing to Solomon at night. Now, is this a dream that he's talking to Solomon in? Very well could be. And then you notice how he says that he has chosen this house. So now back then it was a physical house, but now he's talking about our spiritual temple. I keep bringing this up because it's extremely important for us to understand that our, our, um, our bodies is his tabernacle. That's always been the plan is that he will dwell inside of us and we would be like a, a temple for him. Um, Let's go on. Let's look at uh, verse 13 and 14. All right. Now you looking at verse 13, you see how he's he's kind of answering that prayer that Solomon had did over in the previous. I believe it was the previous chapter. Let's look over there um, right quick. Yeah, is actually in um, Second Chronicles chapter six. We see Solomon's dedication prayer. That was a serious prayer. We did a class on um, this prayer um, because it's talking about how if we were to turn towards the temple um, and say our prayers, it kind of give them extra force, extra power, kind of you know. And you know, since we are prayer warriors, you know, that's kind of important to us to understand. Um, you know, anything that will give our prayers extra boost. So we did a whole class on that. But you see, this over here is the answer to it. You know, over there where Solomon was saying, you know, I pray thee, Father, that if your people will pray towards this tabernacle, will you answer their prayer kind of thing? Well, you can see in chapter seven how the prayer was answered. Um, we can see, you know, OK, did the father say that? Did he say you have to turn towards the uh, temple? Let's see. Uh, verse 14 says, if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. OK, um, looking down through here, these are the only two verses that I've highlighted. Um, let's look at verse 15. Now mine eyes shall be open and my ears attend unto the prayer that is made in this place. Talking about the temple. Um, so it's not really saying turn towards the temple that may be over there in the east. But I believe it's referring more to the um, temple that is on our conscience here. Um, look at verse 16 it says for now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be there forever and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. No, no, 
um, we need to go over and revisit that class that we did from Second Chronicles in chapter six and compare it to the answer that we got over here in Second Chronicles chapter seven, because you know our Father in His infinite wisdom um, is answering Solomon's uh, temple dedication prayer with respect to the third temple, that spiritual temple. He's saying that, you know, if we can pray in a humble manner um, and, you know, seek his face through our, through our prayers, then, you know, our prayers will be answered. So that's really interesting. We'll come back and we'll look at that some more. Like I said, we'll revisit that class that we did on um, um, praying to the east and give like an answer to that class. But let's jump over here and let's look at Nehemiah chapter 1 I'm sorry Nehemiah chapter 9 and verse 1 we see that this is actually talking about the 24th day of the month so you would have again you would have the 8th day celebration on um, the 22nd and then you would have had um, them going back home on the 23rd now let me go ahead and read this it says now in the 24th and fourth day of this month the children of israel were assembled with fasting and sackcloth and earth upon them now you have to jump over to the end of chapter 8 to see that they are in fact talking about the, the feast of tabernacles you see right there it says and they kept the feast for seven days and on the eighth day was a solemn assembly according to the manner and then over here we're on the 24th day um seems like it's kind of skipped the day but um i'm sure there's uh some way to reconcile all of that but the main thing that we want to understand from this verse right here is um number two it says and the seed of israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the inequities of their fathers so here it is after the feast of tabernacles is over where um they we would have been building the third temple and you see now that that feast is over you see some separation being made like um you know these people have you know built their temple they've established their temple and now they're starting to separate themselves from the strangers and you know the other individuals like i talked about in one of my other classes when you start to keep these feasts when you start to keep these statutes when you start to obey the commandments and the judgments you actually are converted over to what we know as spiritual israel the word israel is a spiritual name it never was supposed to designate designate a race of people at all that's why you know it's it, that's why Jacob's name was changed to an ad, angelic name by ending in el makes it an angelic name and it's actually talking about a spiritual race of people and just like Jacob did you can go over and read that story in the book of Genesis um when he actually made a conscious decision to allow um our father the creator to become his God is when his name was changed to Israel. Well, the same way it is for us today, when we start to obey the statutes and allow our father to become our God, then we too become Israel. That's a very important point that we understand is that we actually become Israel. Well, you see here that, you know, it is on the 24th day of the seventh month that there's a separation made between us who are now Israel and those who are still Gentiles you know you you read over in in you know some parts of the um, New Testament let me jump over there and look and we'll come back over here in a second looking over here in Matthew chapter 10 we just did a class on this entire chapter not too long ago you guys check our channel you know our classes are what they call evergreen classes you know at least about 80 to 90 percent of our classes are classes that you know they don't wear out with time 
you can go back and look at classes we did from three, four years ago, and they will still be just as, you know, valuable today as they was back then because they're scriptural based classes and just like the scripture never changes, the, the value of those classes won't change as well. But you see over here, you see right there in verse 35, he says, I am come to set a mar man at variance against his father and the daughter against the mother and the daughter-in-law against the mother-in-law. You see right there in 34, he says, think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came to send I came not to send peace, but a sword. So, you know, that's what it's talking about over there in Nehemiah. You see right there in verse 37, he said, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. This is that separation that's talked about over there in, in, in Nehemiah. Now, sure, these are still our loved ones. And sure, you know, we will st always honor our parents and such. What is primarily talking about is when those individuals try to drive you back towards a sin state. You know, when now that we've cleaned up, now that we've, you know, got a clean slate. Um, we, we can sometimes get around these people and they want to do stuff like keep the pagan holidays and, you know, they, you know, may have a problem with us when we don't want to celebrate those pagan holidays with them. Well, that's what this verse is talking about. You know, if you love your mother more than me, meaning that, you know, if your mother wants to have a pagan holiday dinner and she invites you over there, you know, and if you feel pressured and you, you go over there um, breaking the first commandment and, you know, maybe even a few more commandments by participating in that pagan meal. If you do that for the sake of the love of your mother, then you're not worthy of him, you know. And so we can mess up what we have created by letting our family members um, um, persuade us. Like, for instance, um, I don't want to name any. I'm trying not to name any of those uh, holidays. I probably should, you know, name them so you know what I'm talking about. These are holidays on the pagan wheel over there. Let me jump over there. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and name them. I'll spare you guys the um, picture here. I just went into Google and typed in pagan holidays. And you'll see that there are actually eight holidays. I mean, I list them all here, but there are eight uh, pagan holidays, just like you have holy days. The Father has seven holy days around the year. By keeping those uh, feast days, we actually receive the seal of God. Well, the opposite is true, too. If you keep the pagan holidays, you kind of get that pagan seal. Well, you see some of these holidays, um, even though they're going by different names, you see here when you when you type in pagan holiday, you get the pagan names. But you can recognize some of these holidays here. That one that says winter solstice, that's actually Christmas. That one that says spring equinox, that's when we celebrate Easter. Um and then that one down there, it actually gives you the name um, as Halloween. Well, there's there for a lot of people who have now started building their third temple, their children are going to be a little bit upset when they try to tell them that you can't keep Halloween. We're not trick-or-treating this year. You can imagine those kids laying out. Some of them are going to throw tantrums. Some of those kids are really going to cut up. Well, what Matthew chapter 10 is talking about is that if you allow the love of your child to get you over there celebrating these other ho holidays, you're not really worthy of him. And the way I believe it works is it's going to undo what you've done. It's going to cancel out um what you the efforts that you've done as far as keeping the holy days i believe that's why they are strategically placed around the calendar for instance right after you finish um um feast of tabernacles you have halloween and then of course there's um the feast of hanukkah we're going to be talking about that um holiday coming up here next after you finish hanukkah you have christmas and then you know and then after you finish the spring feast days talking about passover and unleavened bread of course you know you got the pagan holiday that comes right after that and that's easter i believe they're strategically placed on the calendar in order to get us breaking the first commandment which says that we will 
you know, worship no other gods. Well, you see, though, you see me being careful not to mention, you know, a lot of these names on here because they are the names of pagan gods. That's what they're celebrating when, you know, they 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 perform the rituals associated with those holidays. They're actually doing it to worship their God the same way with us, you know, sleeping in a booth. Is a way of worshiping our God. Um, drinking wine on Passover, that's how we worship our God. Well, you know, that trick-or-treat candy, those lights, or those Easter eggs, or those bunnies, or whatever, that's how they actually worship those gods. And so that's what uh, Matthew chapter 10 is talking about when it says, if you love your son or daughter more than me, then you're not worthy of me. You know, it's not really saying to avoid them altogether. Don't go visit mama no more. It's no. When mama start talking that, you know, pagan stuff, you know, it's like, oh, mama, I don't, I don't participate in that stuff anymore. So that is what Nehemiah chapter nine and verse two is talking about when it says, and the seed of Israel separated themselves from all the strangers and stood and confessed their sins and the inequities of their fathers. So now this is important. The confession of the sins part is because, you know, many of us have, you know, celebrated these, these holidays, you know, for years and we have done other things to, um, break the uh the commandments that we read about over there in the law and you know confession goes a long way you think about your, your own children you know and you know if you were to come home and the child comes up to you and says mama daddy i have done a bad thing i'd like to confess that i've done this bad thing well you can imagine the punishment schedule won't be so severe as if you had to find out on your own or even if the child went further and even lied about it and said that they didn't do it, you know, if they confessed that they did it, you know, they, they may not have to, you know, see the belt at all. It may just be a little bit of talking to, but, you know, the opposite is true if they, you know, are denying it or lying about it or whatever. So, you know, let's, we need to get in, in the art of, you know, confessing what it is that we've done wrong. Our father, he knows it anyway. You know, just like a wise parent or whatever, he know he know who broke that thing or he know who ate that cookie or whatever. He, he know you did it. Well, you know, when we actually confess our sins, um, it, it'll go a long way to, to where we may not get punished for it so much. All right. Now, look right here. Um, verse three says, and they stood up in their place and read in the book of the law of the Lord of God. One fourth part of the day and another fourth part, they confessed and worshiped the Lord, their God. OK, so this is stressing how important it is to read and understand this law. You know, after I finish this video, I'm going to go over and I'm going to turn on um, the book of Exodus. And I'll show you over there what it's talking about, the book of the law. It starts in Exodus chapter 20 with the uh, Ten Commandments. You see the Ten Commandments listed in Exodus chapter 20. And then when you go to chapter 21, you see verse 1 is talking about the judgments. Um, and when you look in, the judgments go through 22. And then when you look in chapter 23, you see it's talking about... Uh, the statutes you can read about all of the statutes in leviticus 23 but there are, are three or four that are mandatory that's the sabbath day the feast of unleavened bread uh the feast of tabernacles that we're talking about now and pentecost um you can see right there in verse 14 those are the statutes but then when you go on in the the, in this chapter, you see how verse 20 is talking about how he's going to send an angel to come keep us in the way. So we actually have help to actually keep the law and to actually help us through the tribulation. Well, look over here in Malachi chapter four um, and verse four. This is the last chapter of the Old Testament. And he's reiterating that. See, in verse four, he's saying, remember the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all of Israel. So when he's talking about the law, when you hear people talking about the law, they're talking about the book of the covenant. It starts in Exodus chapter 20 and it goes through and ends in Exodus chapter 24, verse seven. Let me show you that right quick. Um, 
the law, the, the commandments, st statutes, and judgments actually ended over there in um, 23. And But this is kind of the end of the whole story over here when you get down to verse 7 when he says, And he took the book of the covenant and read it in the audience of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said will we do and be obedient. So that is actually the law that it's talking about. I stress that because, you know, there's a lot of confusion, you know, people, you know, thinking that the law involves all of the rules, all 613 different rules that you find in the Old Testament. No, the law doesn't include sacrificial laws. The, the, co the covenant doesn't include um, um, dietary laws. It you know, there's nothing in there that says you're supposed to hit a man in the head with a rock for doing this or doing that. Um, nothing about killing people at all in the book of the covenant. We're never instructed to actually, you know, that's not part of the covenant that we're under. So that's why it's important for us to go over there and read that. And but you're looking over here like we was reading in Exodus chapter 23, how he's saying, you know, to remember the commandments, we saw that, the statutes, we saw that, the judgments of the book of the covenant. And then you read in verse 5, it says, Behold, I send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And so, and then when you look over at chapter 3, it's telling you, making a connection between this Elijah the prophet and the covenant angel. So what it's talking about in Exodus chapter 23 is how we will get the indwelling of the Elijah spirit, this covenant angel. Um, in other parts of the Bible, they call, he's called Michael. Um, a lot of places he's called the covenant angel, and in a lot of places he's called Elijah. And you hear people talk about the Elijah spirit. This is who they're talking about, but it is necessary that we obey the um, covenant in order to ever hear from this angel. So that's why you see them over here in Nehemiah chapter 9 um, reading this uh, book of the covenant like they're reading it every day, they're reading it for a few hours every day, you know, going forward, even after the Feast of Tabernacles is over. It's like they're drilling in those rules. And I, I would believe that is actually necessary um, to keep this uh, tabernacle constructed. Uh, intact, you know, we the semen ain't quite dried on this this um, this structure that we're building here, this spiritual structure where you can imagine you don't want the rain to hit it and wash away some of that cement. You know, it may weaken the foundation on this thing. So we have to be really careful until you know this thing hardens up, and then we don't have to worry about you know um, some of those arrows of the of of the devil trying to get in and mess us up. All right. And another point that I'll make over there when it's talking in um, verse 2, when it's saying separated from Israel, you know, this is what um, Genesis, I mean, not Genesis, but the book of Revelation is talking about when he says to come out of her. You read about that over in the book of Revelation in chapter 18, where you have this mighty angel coming down. And it's saying there in verse 2, it says, And cry with a, a strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen. Um, and then you see down there in verse 4, how we're saying, Come out of her, talking about coming out of Babylon. See, in my last class, we told you how or explained how we are a modern day Egypt because we're still embracing the, the technologies and different things that was created over there in Egypt, like purchasing food and, and doctors and schools and prisons and all of that stuff was created in Egypt. And, you know, since we still have that stuff going on today, we're kind of a modern Egyptian culture. Well, we are also a modern Babylonian culture because it was in Babylon that all of the false religions was created. All of those, um, pagan holidays that we talked about a few minutes ago they were actually created in babylon where a false religion was you know built around those and we still keep you know many of those holidays even today you know a lot you hear people sometimes say that uh, christianity is one of the most pagan religions there is is because you know it, it is the it is the Christian religion that has incorporated the worship of those pagan gods into their religion. You know, you, you don't see the Muslims um, 
religiously celebrating Easter or Christmas. You know, Christianity is only the, the only religion that religiously celebrates pagan holidays opposed to the pagans. <laughs> you know, they, they celebrate them religiously too. But you see right here in um, to, in verse um, 4, it says to come out of that religion, to separate us out of that, get us out of that religion, or we're going to be a partaker in her sins um, and going to receive of her plagues. Um, you also have Hanukkah coming up. That's a very big, big, big deal. Um, guys, we haven't... We kind of missed those over there a few years and not celebrated Hanukkah like we should be paying attention to it. I believe it's because, you know, everybody thought it had something to do with um, lighting a candle, you know, for eight days or whatever, which, you know, you find that over in the Talmud. But, you know, when you look at what the Bible actually says about Hanukkah, it's, you know, a much, much bigger deal. It's kind of like um, a second past or uh, second uh, tabernacles. It actually... It, it, you know, and I'm going to do some classes on this as we, you know, learn going away, but it, it almost appears to be like a Pentecost type event. I mean, if you think about, um, how you had, um, unleavened bread and at the end of unleavened bread, you had the feast of first fruits. And then after the feast of first fruits, you counted 50 days until you got to Shavuot or Pentecost, which was another mandatory feast. Well, after the Feast of Tabernacles, you have the eighth day, which is called uh, Shemini as the red or something like that. But you count 57 days and then you end up on the Feast of Hanukkah. So, you know, those seven days, I was trying to figure out where those extra seven days come from. Um, it either has something to do with what we were reading about over there in um, Nehemiah chapter 9 verse 1 because Solomon he kept his feast going for he, he kept a 14 day feast instead of a 7 day feast so that may be where those extra 7 days are at but I also saw over let me show you this right quick over here in the book of Jubilees and uh, chapter 28 is talking about Reuben uh, Israel's firstborn, the firstborn child of uh, Israel, or firstborn child of Jacob, was actually born on the 13th, 14th day of the ninth month. And, you know, that could be, that could have something to do with those seven days that we're, um, there was additional seven days because it is about seven days later that you start the Feast of Hanukkah. But anyway, we'll get to working on those. Don't forget about the date of Purim. Um, we'll be watching that those dates coming up and remember guys we're looking for spiritual events um, don't be like those guys that's really only looking for something you know physical to happen if you're waiting for a physical event that's going to be at the last moment you're going to miss a lot of spiritual stuff taking place for instance this tabernacle being built um, on our hearts you know if you're waiting to see only the physical events your tabernacle may not get much construction done you know at all so let's keep looking for the spiritual you know the, the physical stuff will take place it is that that physical that spiritual stuff that we can actually miss so anyway i'm gonna go ahead and close this out if you got something out of this video go ahead and hit the like button if you didn't hit the dislike button but leave us a comment either way and shalom may the lord bless thee and keep thee May the Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace.